Okay, well, uh, I'd also like to welcome you to at PESC for 2017. My name is Ray Loy. I'm the Deputy Program Director, um, and uh, I'm also um, ALCF's um, lead for training debuggers and math libraries. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the different computing systems that you'll have available to you for the coming two weeks. Um, these include uh, systems at ALCF, our, our new KNL based machine Theta, um, our current production machines, which are BlueJeans, uh, Mira, Cetus, and Vesta, as well as a um, x86 GPU uh, compute cluster uh, called Cooley. Um, we have a little bit of info also about the OLCF systems, uh, Cray. Um, the Cray Titan system, as well as the NERSC systems like Cori. So as Marta mentioned, um, the um, leadership computing facilities are at uh, Argonne and at Oak Ridge, and these are specifically catering towards very large scale runs, right? These are uh, capability computing rather than uh, capacity computing. Right, whereas NERSC is, NERSC's mission is, is more of a, um, uh, providing cycles for smaller jobs. So we at the leadership uh, facilities tend to support a smaller number of projects but much larger uh, both runs and allocations to do those runs. Uh, the current, as I mentioned, the current production systems at uh, ALCF are the Blue Gene systems and uh, the um, at Cray XK7 system at Oak Ridge, Titan is their current production systems, but of course we're both working on uh, the next generation as well, and um, I'll say a few more words about um, Argonne's uh, system uh, in a few slides. So, um, right, I mentioned uh, Mira is the, at Argonne, Mira is the large uh, system. So, um, you probably don't want to start doing runs right there. You probably want to um, uh, do some smaller tests. Uh, you'll be using Cetus and Vesta or the smaller systems. Cetus is on the same file system as Mira, so uh, it's in some ways a little uh, easier to transition if you set up your code on Cetus. Um, and then you can use the same files and binary and everything to um, run on Mira. Um, Vesta um, is on a different file system, but is otherwise the same as well. Uh, I mean, it's the same um, uh, system software and everything. And it has a slightly smaller um, minimum job size. So uh, in that respect, it's better for debugging than Cetus. But uh, both are uh, a better choice to start with than Mirror itself. Um, if you happen to need to do some GPU work or just need a um, kind of a uh, plain vanilla, you know, um, x86 uh, environment to run, run some kind of setup uh, job or something like that, you know, maybe something that runs for a while and you don't want to run it on a login node, then Cooley is a good place to do this. Um, and, you know, you can just submit a one job node there or something like that. And then uh, off in the corner here, we have uh, Theta is our uh, new system. So I think the next slide says more about that. So um, the next large system at Argonne will be called Aurora, um, but because it will be a few years bec before that comes online, uh, we have an interim system, KNL based, um, which is uh, from Cray, um, so Cray, it's, uh, coming out of the same um, partnership between Cray and Intel that is uh, yielding the Aurora system. So um, Theta, um, <clears throat> Theta has uh, 3,624 nodes, uh, Xeon Phi, KNL. Um, each node has, um, a big feature of it is that it has uh, 16 gigabytes of high-speed multi-channel RAM on the um, node so that uh, you can, um, if, you, if you do things right, you can uh, leverage that for a lot more performance. 
Um, but when you're starting off, you'll probably be using that in cache mode. So I'll, I can come back to that. There's some supplemental material on the different memory modes. Um, there are also SSDs on each node, but uh, we're not currently supporting them for, um, per, you know, uh, for uh, user production use, uh, but we will soon. And um, we have both uh, Lustre and GPFS system, file systems attached to this. So your home directories uh, on Theta are actually on GPFS, but the larger space available is on Lustre. And the, um, uh, if you need a large space to, to set up some code, then you should set up a, a subdirectory in projects at PESC 2017 um, and uh, um, work out of there because your home your home directory quota will not be large enough to, um, you know, put, uh, you know, 50 or 100 gig in there. Okay. Um, keep in mind that Lustre is very sensitive to stripe width. So if you're doing large amounts of I.O., then you'll need to pay some attention to what, what the stripe width is set to for your files. Okay, uh, if you've used other systems, you may be familiar with modules. Modules is a um, software product that uh, sets up your environment, your Unix um, uh, you know, shell environment variables um, for things like your compiler and uh, different libraries and things like that. So Theta is the only system at LCF that uses modules. Um, so I'll mention when we start talking about the blue genes that there's something else used there. But on Theta, we use modules, and um, the most common commands that you might need are listed on this slide. And so let me, let me just mention, there'll be a test later. When you don't know what to do when you're trying to run something, where are you going to look? You're going to look at these slides first, and then there'll be also some supplemental material um, listed along with them that's a little bit more detailed uh, about Theta and about the Blue Gene Q system. So um, you'll, you'll want to, um, uh, they'll be posted by tomorrow, I'm sure, if not later today, uh, on the agenda site, and uh, you can use these as your handy reference. And if you can't find the answer here, then you can ask one of us what to do. Okay, so on Theta, um, when you go to compile, uh, you should absolutely not use MPICC, even though you might be doing that on other machines. Um, the MPICC and MPI whatever, F77, F90 on, the <coughs> excuse me, on Theta, will get you code for the login nodes. This is just how the environment's set up. You actually want to use just plain CC or FTN, and the, um, uh, the modules environment has connected those to the correct compiler for the compute nodes. Um, by default, um, <clears throat> you're going to get the Intel compilers. Uh, that's probably what you want, but if you need to get the Cray compilers, you can swap the module using the command here. And there is, uh, is also available the GNU compilers or uh, Clang L, L <clears throat> Clang LLVM um, uh, compiler suite. So what does a job script look like uh, for Theta? Um, we are using a job submission uh, scheduler called Cobalt. Cobalt is not the same as PBS. Uh, PBS is more commonly used if you've seen that on other clusters. Cobalt is somewhat similar, but it, it has some differences. Um, but um, this a little example script here uh, will get you going, and um, I'll give you a link to where um, there's a version of this that's actually online that you can just copy. So um, at the top of the file, we have some hash cobalt directives that um, um, th these are equivalent to specifying the options on your queue subline uh, for the, for the um, uh, queuing the job, it's easier to put them in, in the file. Um, so uh, in general, right, you need to specify the time, the number of nodes, 
uh, and a project name. So this was a generic slide. The project name for here, which will be listed on a later slide, is at PESC 2017. And um, you, will, you can ask for two nodes, but the minimum you'll get is actually eight on theta, just as a, a scheduling setting. It's not a, um, a hardware issue. Um, and um, the way you start the job is not with MPI run or MPI exec. It's with a command called app run, uh, which is sort of the cray thing. And um, the next slide will talk more about the uh, options in app run. Uh, and um, this job script shows you um, how you can capture the exit status of the app run. Uh, you could um, potentially do a series of app runs uh, in the script without doing anything special. Um, you could also, th these are all you know, more advanced variations, you could also do an app run on less than the number of nodes that you asked for for the entire job. Uh, and then background them and run, do more than one at the same time. It will figure out the nodes that are um, available and uh, it'll fail if you've asked for too many. So in other words, if you submitted a job for 100 nodes and you could theoretically run two 50 node app runs in there at the same time and you need to script that properly, but I think you get the idea. So app run is the um, command that actually launches the um, parallel execution on the KNL compute nodes. So um, you have uh, different um, option items, dash N for the total number of ranks, dash big N for the ranks per node, and depth is the, right, so, so bear in mind that there's a lot of sort of cray generic terminology with the meaning of these, so I've tried to translate what that meaning is. And um, they, they define depth as the number of CPUs per rank, but when they talk about CPUs, they're um, counting the possibility for hyperthreads. So just keep that in mind. And then uh, you probably want to use a layout that is uh, called depth. So in that case, dash CC depth is, depth is not a, um, a number that you fill in. Depth is actually a keyword. So. Uh, you can look at the man page for app run if you want to look at all the other variations. And um, dash J hyperthreads will set the number uh, per compute unit. So in general, um, you probably just want to say J1. Um, and especially if you're doing threading yourself in your code, then you, you don't want to um, lay down more processes than there are actual um, hardware cores. Uh, so you may need to set environment uh, options for uh, OpenMP threads, and then uh, more advanced usage would be setting um, the affinity for where the threads lie. So these are described in the man page, so we're going to try not to delve into too much detail right now. So how do you submit a COBOL job? You do use the command QSUB, uh, just like for PBS. Um, and uh, depending on uh, whether you specified some of these options, uh, like the uh, dash A, the dash Q, T, whatever, those could be in the job script. Uh, so uh, if you did, in fact, put those in the job script, like the example, you, you end up with just a simple submission, qsub job dot, uh, job script dot sh or whatever your script is named. Um, if you fail to give a Q name, it'll be default. Uh, for at PESC, you're generally going to want to use the queue name called training. This will be summarized on a later slide. Uh, training points to nodes that we have reserved for at PESC, but you're, if either none are reserved or if none are available, you're welcome to just run in the default queue, although you might wait longer. So generally, you'll want to use the training queue if it exists. And um, uh, at PES 17 here is the uh, name of the project that you are all part of. Right, that's like a, an allocation um, um, for the event. And uh, as I mentioned, there is an eight known minimum job size on Theta. So after you submit your job, you can use QSTAT to see what's going on. 
um, various flavors of QSTAT. Uh, you don't get a huge amount of information about a job unless you say dash FL, then you'll get everything. Um, I think if UV is the queuing system, it'll be fairly straightforward. Oh, what does COBOL do when the job actually runs? Well, it'll create some log files for you. Um, when you first submit, you'll see the the COBOL log file. So you'll see by, by default, you'll see something like a number like 12345.cobalt log. Uh, that number is the job, the jobs number. And then um, when it actually starts running, you'll see the same number dot error and the same number dot output. Those are the standard error and standard output. Uh, so that's where, where everything will show up. You can change the name of the prefix if you want it to be something other than the job number. Just do that at the time of submission. So one thing that'll be really handy for you is if you <clears throat> submit an interactive job. So what does an interactive job mean in a batch queuing context? It means that you submit a job and it sort of hangs there waiting until there are the nodes are available. And then when they are available, you get a shell prompt and it's set up in its environment so that when you run a command like app run, it will target the nodes that are reserved for your job. So in other words, you have a job, but instead of running a script, it's just running a shell where you can then run the same kind of commands that you would in the script. Um, so you use, you use the dash capital I option to invoke that and um, you see here I use training, which is the queue that, for the reserved nodes and at PEST 2017. Um, just be aware that when you get the prompt, this is a new shell than the one that you had before you ran the queue sub, right? It's a distinct and different shell. Um, also note that, right, the job exists for a fixed amount of time. And when the job goes away, the shell won't get killed. The reason that the shell won't get killed is because suppose you were editing a source file in there or something like that. We don't want you to lose it. But what will happen is that you will no longer be able to run uh, a parallel job anymore, right? So if you try to run, it'll say something like the resource is not available or the nodes are not available or something like that. So if you're working along and things are kind of going like you expect and then you you know, maybe it was a half an hour job and you lost track of time and then all of a sudden it's not running at all, do a QSTAT of your job ID, right, which you can actually get right out of um, this environment variable called Cobalt Job ID. Just do a QSTAT and if there's no output at all, the job doesn't exist anymore. So you should exit, you know, save whatever you're doing, exit, and then do, a, do another interactive job. But the main point here is that if you use an interactive job, you only have to wait in the queue once, and then you get this prompt for the whole duration, you can just keep doing runs. You can do app run, app run, app run, and you don't have to re-queue. So um, for this um, class, we have reserved nodes, but there's still some overhead of going, you know, even if nodes are available, there, you know, there's a minute or two of a delay. Uh, before your job will you know, actually start up and things like that. So it's very handy to get quicker turnaround um, using the interactive job um, feature. So what happens when something crashes? Well, you know, you can't really get, um, you know, a thousand or three thousand or however many core binary core files written out. So. Um, it doesn't, uh, the system doesn't do that, you know, at, at, the, at the most you might get one binary core file. Um, but um, if you are trying to figure out what's going on, you probably want to enable something called ATP, abnormal termination processing. And what this does is it uh, generates a merge stack backtrace of all of your ranks and dumps it into a file. And then you can use another program called StatView to display it. So think of it as a, sort of like a call tree where um, the branches indicate that, you know, some ranks are down, you know, main called uh, function foo, and then half of the ranks called function bar, and you can see that half of them are in foo and half of them are in bar, and then one of them core dumped, 
you know, or something like that. So uh, you can navigate it that way. Um, it's also possible if you have a program that's hung to take snapshots, generate one of these backtraces uh, asynchronously while it's running using a program called STAT. And so there are links to more information about how to do that. Um, if you can't reach these, I can um, give you, um, you, you may need uh, for um, some of those, uh, I'm not sure whether you were given um, uh, logins to the, um, um, it's sort of like a wiki uh, site. And if not, then um, those instruction pages can easily be um, um, uploaded for you guys. So just let me know. Okay, so that finishes uh, talking about the KNL system. Do you, oh, do you have a, oh, and feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. Uh, I think that as you go and do it, uh, which we'll have, you know, the first, I think the first hands-on session is tomorrow night, I'll be here. And uh, of course, I expect uh, there'll be a lot more, lot more questions if you haven't used the system. So I'm moving on from the uh, theta system. Hmm? So, uh, what's the maximum number of KNL nodes that we have access to? Um, well, the whole machine is 3,600 uh, nodes. Um, how many are reserved for the class depends on the day and the time. Uh, but if you need to run something larger than is reserved, you can submit it, and then we can try to bump its priority. So it's not you're you're not you know limited. We're, we're not limiting you. But the larger it is, it just may take a little longer to run. But we may be able to do larger runs overnight or something like that. So <clears throat> the same thing goes for all of the systems. I mean, we want to um, help you do whatever you need to do. And um, we have some latitude for it. Uh, OK. Uh, so I'm moving on to the BlueGene system. So BlueGene is a very different non x86 uh, architecture. Um, you know, it's, uh, the processors are um, in the PowerPC family, but they're not exactly the same as uh, garden variety PowerPCs. They have uh, quad floating point units and some other neat hardware in them. Uh, but I'm not going to go into uh, the details since that's the older system. But if you are interested in using it, I'll just give you some uh, quick tips on how to get started. So as I mentioned, Theta is the only system that uses modules. The other systems at LCF, so namely the BlueGenes and Cooley, the Unix cluster, um, they use something called SoftEnd, which performs the same function to set your software environment, your compiler paths, and stuff like that. But it, it, it works differently than modules. Um, so, uh, SoftEnd reads values out of a file in your home directory called .soft. And um, because Mira and Cooley share the same home file system, the settings for Cooley are in soft Cooley. So just be aware that you're on your, in your Mira home for Mira and Cetus, you'll set things in .soft. But for Cooley, it's in .soft.cooley. So uh, you may or may not have to add uh, a key for MPI wrappers. Um, but the example here, where it selects Excel compilers uh, for, the, um, for MPI compilation, so you have this key plus MPI wrapper Excel. This is where you would also choose things like uh, whether you want the GNU compiler chain or um, the, um, uh, the Clang chain. And then this at default here is very important because that gives you all the other stuff that is by default in your path. And um, you don't want to delete that because you may not be able to log in again. So after you edit um, this file, you need to type a command, the command called resoft to refresh your environment. Uh, or you can log out and log back in again. So um, as I mentioned, you can choose the compiler using one of these keys. Uh, the example before was MPI wrapper XL. So that gives you access to the, uh, the XL, C, right? XL is the IBM compilers, which are the um, you know, most specific ones for the BlueGene architecture. 
Um, the C compiler, the C++ compiler is uh, CXX. Uh, various Fortran flavors, whether it's uh, Fortran 90, Fortran 2003. The, the, um, the later uh, versions of Fortran do not necessarily support the full standard for, um, you know, you're not going to be able to get like uh, Fortran 2008 full support. It's just not available on the platform. And uh, if you're running threaded code on a blue gene, you have to remember to add the underscore R on the end of the compiler wrappers to get the right one to generate thread safe code. Uh, so let's see, there's an example there. If you want to use the GNU, GNU compilers, then the key is, is listed here, MPI wrapper GCC, and you use uh, slightly different uh, wrapper names, uh, MPI CC, so forth. Um, don't get confused that, you know, once you, you know, once you change the key in your soft file, you want to make sure to run the compiler command and, you know, with like dash dash version or something like that to, um, uh, experimentally verify that you get, are getting the compiler that you expected. Uh, same thing for um, the clan compilers. You use the key and then the appropriate wrapper name. So uh, on BlueGene, the jobs, BlueGene also uses COBOL, but there are some differences because of the architecture is slightly different. You don't use um, app run here, you use run job instead. So run job is the IBM version of uh, MPI run, MPI exec. Um, and you need to uh, choose a mode for the node. Uh, so this is the uh, analogous situation of all the options for app run on Theta is that uh, we have the number of ranks per node um, on the blue gene because there are hard booted into a, a mode setting the number of ranks, uh, which also implies a division of the memory on the node. So that's the dash P argument. You have the number of ranks. And this block name, the targeted nodes that are in a block um, must be specified uh, on the run job line but you don't know what those nodes are until the job actually runs. So they're set in an environment variable called cobalt part name. And then this is very important. Um, this colon here is actually a token and it needs to have spaces before and after it. That's why I put a couple to give a gap. It is not just punctuation. If you say E, you know, in the part name here, if you said E colon H with no spaces, it will fail to parse it and give you a very strange error message. So if you're running on BlueGene, put spaces there. Let's see, um, pay attention to the options that some of them use single dashes and some of them use double. Um, unfortunately, sometimes PowerPoint swallows the double dashes, but they all look correct here. Uh, and uh, just like the case for the job scripts on Theta, you can run multiple, multiple runs one after the other. Uh, running multiple, multiple backend jobs at the same time is not as easy as it is on Theta where you could just say, you know, run this on 50 nodes, background it, run this on 50 nodes, and as long as you had 100, it's okay. It's, it's significantly more complicated on BlueGene. You can do it. And we have an entire um, set of documentation on how to do it, but I'm not going to talk about it here. Um, if you need to pass environment variables into your run, then you need to use the dash dash ends um, uh, option uh, to run job. So you'd stick it, for example, before the colon, right? The only thing that comes after the colon is uh, your executable name and option, you know, your own executables options. So in the same way that Cobalt works on Theta, you have the files created for the standard out, the standard error, the Cobalt log. The options to QSub are pretty much the same. The options to QSTAT are pretty much the same. So you'll see that here. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the main difference is using run job instead of app run and um, specifying the block name. Okay, uh, 
in the same way, there's interactive job support on the blue jeans. Um, the only difference here, which I've highlighted in blue, is that when you get your interactive job shell, it's just a, something that's difficult to handle in the system. The partition that you are booting, in other words, the set of nodes that you're booting to run on, they may not be done booting at the time that you get the prompt. So if you immediately run something, kind of depends on how many nodes you asked for. If you immediately run something, it may just fail because they're not ready yet. So there's a command called wait boot that will pull the state status, and then uh, as soon as they're ready, it'll, it'll say so. So if you just run that, then as soon as that says, hey, you're good to go, then you can uh, run command. So um, you can then just you know, run a run job command, or uh, you can just execute your job script, right, which is just going to run a run job command too. So um, you don't need to, if you already got a job script, but you're trying to debug something you're running interactively, right? you can still type the name of the job script to execute in the interactive job. That applies on both systems. It's just um, something you may not think about because you've got the prompt. But at the prompt, you can run the job script. So on a blue gene, uh, the hardware itself, right? you can't just say, I want one node. There are hard, physical hardware partition sizes because of the Taurus network. Right? The Taurus links only exist in certain places and so forth. So the bottom line is that um, on Vesta, the minimum size that you can boot as a chunk that is given to you is 32 nodes. On Cetus, it's 128, and on Mira, it's 512. On Mira, that's actually a combination of constraints between the physical, the physical constraints are actually 128, but because the system is so large, it's hard to define all of the 128 node blocks. So we just um, administratively chosen to not support smaller than 512. So the, you just need to keep this in mind that you know even if you submit a job, if you submit a job on Mira for one node, you're going to really be asking for 512 and be waiting for 512. That, that's the only implication, right? And remember, I um, mentioned in the run job options that you needed to choose the number of ranks per node with the dash P option. And um, the, uh, right, what's happening is that you have 16 cores on a node and the memory is being, the mem both the memory and the cores are being, they're being booted in a configuration uh, so that the um, the cores are, you know, you the cores and a portion of the memory are being divided up for that number of ranks, right? So if you um, try to run 16 ranks on a node, then each rank will get roughly a sixteenth of the memory. If you only run eight ranks on the node, then you'll have two cores assigned to each rank and twice as much memory. And what does that really mean? It means you can run twice as many threads. So right, you wouldn't want to um, undersubscribe processes on the node unless you were planning to use either pthreads or OpenMP to put more threads on it. Because there's no, um, uh, the threads on, on BlueGene, the threads are a mechanism for parallelism. They're not a mechanism for scheduling. So in other words, the, you don't oversubscribe threads onto hardware on a blue gene. Um, you're just using them. So if you have two cores, um, each, each core can run four threads. So if you're, just as an example, if you're running eight ranks, then you have two cores for each rank and therefore eight threads available for each rank. So. So speaking about OpenMP, um, you need to remember to use the ThreadSafe compilers and set the number of uh, you know, OMP num threads so that it gets started upright. So Cooley. So as I mentioned, you probably won't use, this is not a, a massively, you know, it is a, it is a cluster and it might actually be as big of cluster as clusters that you have used before. But for us, this is sort of the small system that you use for post-processing and visualization, but um, I'll, um, so it's, um, 
you know, uh, it, it, ha it does have GPUs, so that is, the, that is um, you know, one of the more interesting things about it. But um, it also uses Cobalt to submit jobs, and because of system differences, uh, there, you know, it's a little, the job scripts for here are yet a little more different than the other two systems. So um, you need to um, construct a, um, there, the, uh, there's a, f a, f a node file will be provided to your job that you can read. And um, for simple cases, you don't need to manipulate it, but, uh, but you do need to point MPI run to it. Right, so out of the three systems, this is the only one that uses MPI run. And you need to um, figure out how many uh, ranks that you're going to run. And this script is set up so that you know, each node has 12 cores. So it's just going to run uh, 12 ranks per node, in the, um, per node that your job has. So if it's a one node job, it'll run 12 ranks. Um, and other than that, it's still Cobalt, uh, so it's very similar. Okay, so this is that summary slide that I was talking about earlier. So the project name that you have to you know, use compute time for all of the machines, it's called at PES 2017, big surprise. And um, whenever possible, you want to use the Q call training, right? So you'd be saying Q sub dash Q training and that accesses the reserved nodes. So how do you tell if some of them are reserved at this time or not? This command show res, show reservations, will, show, will give a list of every reservation that's currently either active or coming up in the future on the machine. And you can look at it and say, oh yeah, right now training has you know, 500 nodes allocated to it until 10 o'clock or something. So you do have to keep in mind that um, if you try to start a job and there's only one hour left in the reservation, then you can't start a job that's 70 minutes, right? That kind of thing. So if your job is not starting, take a look at you know, what's going on. Maybe you can just um, change the length of the time because you know, often when you're working, you just say, oh, I'll just submit it for an hour and maybe it really only runs for 15, 20 minutes, but it's not worth tweaking it every time you submit it. So uh, you may need to, as toward the end of the evening or the end, end of the hands-on session or whatever, you may need to you know, adjust your times to be uh, fit in so that the jobs actually start. Okay, it mentions crypto card pins and I have a few tips about that um, on this slide. So um, for those of you who haven't logged in or those of you who have, um, I just thought I would mention that the crypto card display, it's a hex string, but it's case sensitive. And that's really a nuisance. So every letter has to be typed capital, otherwise it's not going to work. And so, um, and you know, the general way these things work is right, the card has some random, pseudo-random sequence that it's generating. At the other end, at the server, it knows what that secret sequence is, and it has some window that it will accept like the next five in that stream, right? So until you successfully log in, it doesn't advance that window, right? They don't talk to each other by radio or something weird like that. They don't know what they're doing, right? You got the little fob there. So if you fail to log in, and you, you know, whenever you push the button, you get the next one in the sequence. If you have enough failures logging in, you'll get out of sync with the other end, right? That's, that's, that's what the out of sync thing is. So, so what I would suggest is, you know, if it fails to log in the first time, just try it again, because if it was a typo, you know, until you are successful, it doesn't invalidate the current, the current number, right? So just try typing it again. And then if that fails, then I would say, well, Let's just try logging into a different machine, right? If you're trying to log into Mira uh, and you fail twice, try logging into Theta instead because maybe there's just something transient wrong with that host. Because as soon as you successfully log in, it resets your like failed login attempts and then you won't get locked out. So this is like all um, defensive um, procedure for not getting yourself locked out. So we have, 
because we expect a lot of problems with you know, a large bunch of new users. Um, we've taken steps to prevent the IP addresses here from getting blacklisted because you know, after, uh, uh, normally after, I don't know, five attempts from one IP that fail, it would blacklist the entire IP from the site and then nobody would get on. But, so we, we got that covered. But for just you personally, um, you know, try to, uh, try to use these tips. So uh, let's see. Um, how do you know what's going on in the machine? Well, there's a, um, a, st an, a dynamically generated web page with the status of the machine. Um, this is the example for Mira. There are similar machines for the, uh, you know, similar pages for the other machines as well. They look a little differently because it's a, it's a graphical representation of the hardware, right? So in this case, right, each um, pair of blocks here, this is actually one cabinet of Mira, another cabinet, and so forth. There are three, three rows, the, f the first row, second row, right? So there's 16 racks going across and three rows, right? So 48 racks altogether. And um, the same color is the same job, right? In, in a blue gene, um, because of the torus network, and the, the way that the hardware blocks are laid out, they're always spatially contiguous, right? But on a machine like Cooley, which is the Linux cluster with a kind of off-the-shelf network, your same color nodes could be all over the place and they're not really connected nicely like, uh, like in the blue gene. But anyway, you can see whether anything's idle or, or not. And um, then of course the natural question is, well, if they're idle, how come my job's not running? But there might be a reservation or it might be draining or something like that. So. Okay, so um, the job scripts that I was showing in the slide, so you, you could theoretically cut and copy and paste them from the slide, but it's probably a better idea to pull them from an actual file. So here's the path on Theta projects at PES 2017, examples getting started. On the blue genes, um, I didn't have a chance to copy them into a new place, but there is uh, perfectly good examples um, that would not be changed from the APES 2016 project directory. And uh, you could just copy them over and then modify them. So hopefully um, by tomorrow, you'll be running at least a hello world jobs on uh, any of these systems. And then we have user, more user docs online. And in addition to this presentation, I'll have um, a larger presentation for the Blue Gene start getting started as well as the Theta getting started. Um, I'll have them posted um, alongside. So um, besides ALCF, you also have access to the Oak Ridge facilities to Titan, as well as the nurse facilities. So you got some information in your packets about that, and this should sort of summarize it. On Titan, if you log in over there, your project, right, the project here was at PES 2017. The project over there will be gen007 underscore at PESC. And um, uh, your username, and you have a token with a username on it, um, and, a, and a pin there too, so. And uh, if you have questions about how to run at Oak Ridge, Ashley is here. Where did Ashley, I think, just stepped out, but she's around. So um, we have somebody on the on, on site, and um, she can ask, uh, she can answer um, questions about what to do if you're unsure. And then you also have access to Edison and Corey, um, and uh, at NERSC and. Um, the project name there is Ntrain, and the um, so you would SSH to, uh, for example, cori.nurse.gov, and um, we have links to their getting started um, documentation here. Okay, this is the test. Where are you going to go when you don't know what to do? <laughs> to this slide set, okay? And uh, as I said, uh, we'll also post the other slide sets. Any questions?
Okay, this is uh, information you'll need to use uh, frequently and um, soon. <laughs> yeah? So how do I know which machine uh, is best in my project? My <laughs> Uh, well, um, you know, that, that, that uh, partially it's a question of, you know, how big is it? It's a question of what architectures you've run on before. Um, you know, you, we encourage you to actually try running on multiple architectures, right? So it would be a really good experience both to try something that's x86 based, uh, you know, like, um, you know, either um, Theta or Titan. Um, as well as the blue gene, so I, I would say give I would say give them you know give at least two architectures a try if if not three, right? So Titan has um, you know the uh, the GPUs as well, right? So that you got that combo. So so if there's some resource that you absolutely need, for example, it's a GPU and uh, uh, accelerated code, then you're going to want to use Titan because neither um, Theta nor the blue genes have that, right? But if um, it's not accelerated, then, uh, you know, you might want, you know, you, you can try one of the other two and um, try to take advantage of what those platforms have to offer, right? Which might be easier than, you know, you need to specifically write GPU kernels or, and or, you know, annotate it for, um, um, you know, OpenMP or, uh, you know, other um, OpenCL, um, you know, directives. Uh, so it might be easier to try to use, like, say, MKL or something like that on Theta. Mm -hmm. right. It's a slightly different question than normally we would have because uh, um, you're here to ex experience the different architectures. Okay, well, I'll be, uh, I'll be here tomorrow during the hands-on and um, um, in and out for the rest of the duration. Um, so you can always catch me or um, Marta or you can send mail to support if there isn't somebody in the room that... Uh, when you do send mail to support, put in it that you're at at PESC because our, our team knows that, you know, this is an important event for uh, LCF and they'll they'll take notice and, and try to, to give it priority. Mm -hmm. I guess it goes along that same lines of possibly wondering, you know, what software dependencies are available. And so I guess that's a valid question to ask the support team. If oh, sure. If something that's, you know, like. Yes. Okay. Right. So um, in 40 minutes, it's hard to list everything. But we have on Theta, um, if you look at modules, you'll see most of these the software libraries that are installed. On BlueGene, the libraries are not handled through SoftEnv in, in an analogous way, but they are in um, a, a directory called... Uh, on both machines, there are, are, there are software libraries installed in slash soft slash libraries, uh, so you can look there. But if there's something you need, just you know, speak up and we'll, we'll point you to it if we have it. And we have you know, a lot of things like HDF5 and, and NetCDF and you know, things like that that you might need to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. <laughs> Thanks.